Welcome to the Exponential Growth Podcast, where we demystify what it takes to break into tech. I'm your host, James Hudnall, and my goal is to highlight real-life examples of people moving into careers they love, so you can too. Hey everyone, today I'm joined by Geraldo Gomez. Now, I learned about Geraldo and his transition from oil rigs to software development just last week, but today we're going to dig in and deconstruct his journey into tech. Geraldo, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, James. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And maybe just briefly introduce yourself. Who is Geraldo Gomez? Um, okay, so my name is Geraldo. I'm 35. Uh, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I'm fr originally from Brazil. It's been five years since I moved. Um, and I'm a software engineer. It's been, I'm very close to completing my second year as a software engineer. Nice. That's awesome, man. And I know I also don't let me forget. I want to talk about the on-call rotation and whatnot because I haven't had that discussion with any other the people I've interviewed with, and okay. I want to make sure we get to that. So if I forget, I want to I want to circle back. So and okay. speaking of Brazil, I, I don't think I told you this when we met the other day. I uh, I did a mission trip to Sao Paulo, Brazil. It was probably many decades ago now, so I'm dating myself, <laughs> but. That was fun, and I, I do remember obrigado, which is maybe the the most important phrase to uh, to learn in in Portuguese, which I think is thank you. So thank you, yeah. I, I do have <laughs> that, but yeah. Why don't you? Uh, so you're a software developer now, and I think you told me that you used to work on oil rigs, and I know you also attended the same boot camp that I did. But why don't yes. you take it way back? Like, what was it like when you were growing up? What did you think you wanted to do and be when you grew up? Ah, uh, you know. I think that when people think about uh, Brazilians, they think like that they we all want to be like soccer players and stuff when we were young, right? Like because of the, the soccer thing in Brazil. But I never, I was never very good with um, sports at all. Like hmm. I was more of the guy that had video games and everyone would go there and play, you know, like I had Atari, I had Master System, Super Nintendo. I had a bunch of video games growing up. But yeah, so I'm from Rio, the state of Rio, right? Uh, the capital of Rio de Janeiro is also Rio de Janeiro. So I make sure to say like I'm from the state of Rio, not the city. Um, I grew up in a city in the mountains called Nova Friburgo. It's kind of like three hours away from, from Rio. And it's kind of different because it, when you think about Rio, you think about beach, you know, sun, and yeah. the city is in the mountains. And Nova Friburgo is kind of like New Freiburg. So it was... Freiburg is, I think it's in uh, Switzerland or Germany. I'm not sure now. I forgot, but it, it's kind of like it was created by, like it was founded by, you know, European people because, and it was in a very cold area. Um, so I didn't grow up going to the beach and playing, you know, soccer in the sand and stuff like that. Okay. Um, had my first computer when I was probably nine, nine or 10. Um, but before that, I already had, um, video games, as I said, and I, I was, I, I think I'm, I still am a very like person. I'm not a hardware thing, like nerd on computers, but yeah. I, I try my best to, to keep up to date with my computers because I do enjoy playing video games a lot, even today. So I always had a computer. I always had involvements. Like I, I'm I'm pretty good with computers and, and learning new technologies and stuff, but um, I never ever thought about doing software engineering growing up. And when I was 18, I didn't know what to do at all. I mm. I applied for soft uh, I applied for mechanical engineering, and also like uh, international relations. Okay. When I was 18, so like. Where did that come from? Well. My all my I, I'm very I was always good with mathematics and physics and stuff like that and all my friends were applying to mechanical engineering so I was like maybe I should do that too um, and the other thing is that the other side was kind of like I do enjoy like talking to people and trying to teach in a sense like if you go to my LinkedIn profile you'll see that. Everything that I was learning when I was working the oil field, I would try to like write uh, like posts about it. But mm -hmm. I always try to write in the sense of like explaining like I'm five. Yeah, I, I always loved to do that because I feel that the only time that you actually know something is when you can explain it to someone that has no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, 
yeah i and should i continue or well, let me let me <laughs> let me pull on that thread really quickly and, and then we can zoom back out so you had mentioned I, th I think i just heard as you were working on the oil rig which i definitely want to backtrack and build back up to that but it sounds like you were posting on linkedin and you were explaining concepts that you were learning i presume maybe relating to computers and i want to ask you about that was it an intentional decision that you knew that you were establishing this online brand at the time? Were you doing no. it to kind of solidify your learning? What was the, the impetus behind that? I I think it's, uh, as I was writing, I was also like solidifying my learning, but it's kind of like, I think all of us worked with someone that tried to like, kind of like show up just by saying complicated words or trying to, hmm. you know, um, uh, I don't know how, how to explain it. It's just like, I, I try my best not to think too much of myself and to do, and because of that, I try my best to explain everything I do in a very simple way. Sure. And doing that, I, I can take the fear out of the equation from people that want to start on that area. Right. Yeah. So like, if I start talking to you about, I don't know, manage pressure drilling and how you can die if you make mistakes working on, on, on that, on a drill ship, you're going to be like, oh my God, I will never work with that. But if I tell you about like, I don't know, if you want to make a sand castle in the beach, you need to make sure that it's away from the, the waves because the, if the waves come, it's going to hit it and it's going to destroy it. Right. So you got to do make protections, in, you know, and yeah. You know, if you want to control pressure, think about a water hose that you put your finger on top. You can control it by taking the finger and putting it out. So, like, those ideas makes people more interested yeah. and, again, take the fear away. So, that's yeah. what I was trying to do, okay. you know. I feel like a natural storyteller of sorts. Kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, one, like, one thing that I wanted to do, like, I have this uh, interview I did when I was, like, eight. For a for a newspaper in Fribourg, you know, Fribourg, they asked me what I wanted to do when I would grow up, and I said I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, the joke I did when I got this job was that now I'm writing code. So I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> you're right, very yeah. present." <laughs> yeah, I didn't know I was going to write code, but yeah, I was right at the very beginning. Yeah, nice. Okay, well, let's go back to college because you you had mentioned I think mechanical engineering with I, I forget the branch of psychology, but something along those lines based on what you had mentioned. And so, so how did that play out? Well, as I said, I always had video games and computers since the beginning, right? When yeah. I was 18, I was kind of lost. And in Brazil, when I was 18 was the moment where like, land, you know what a land house is? Land houses? No. I, I don't know if you had that in the United States. It's just like to have a computer in Brazil, it's kind of like very expensive. I mean, like 20 years ago, right? So they would have this, uh, like these places with like 20, 25 computers that you would pay like $1 to pay, play one hour, oh, okay. you know? So there was like 30 people playing together and I was so addicted to it that I I wasn't studying and I didn't uh, pass for any college that mm -hmm. I applied for. And I was 18 and I was like, okay, so I, I need to stop this. I need to study because I need to do something with my life. And then next year when I was like, I'm going to study, a friend of mine came to me and said, Hey, Geraldo, why don't you come with me to do this test for a, t a mechanical uh, technician course? It's only 10 bucks and it's, you're going to pass it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it because at least I'll be spending time with something while I study for something else. I passed it. It was a two-year training, um, a two-year course, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I was my first time out of my parents' house. I was living by myself. I was trying. I got my first job in a bank. So I was kind of like, yeah, I'm going to complete this and see how it goes. And um, at the very end of the course, um, there is this company, an oil field company called Schlumberger. There's a very big company. Went to the place where I was doing my training, my, my course, and they were like, we're looking for that many people that know how to speak English. And from like a room with like 150 people, maybe five people left, uh, raised their hands. Wow. No one didn't. No one knew how to speak English other than me and other guys. So, uh, and Schlumberger is like one of, I think it's the biggest third party, like servicing provider company in the oil field. Uh, at least it was. So I started like interning there in December. I was hired in March. In April, I was in Venezuela 
in June I was in the United States and nice. then everything started. Yeah. First time on an airplane was me flying to Venezuela by myself, Very cool. not knowing a single word in Spanish <laughs> and go, like very afraid, but very happy. And, and yeah, um, I'm currently doing college. Like I'm doing a bachelor in software engineering here just because I want to, yeah. I feel like, I feel like my job doesn't require it, um, as like, as a, prerequisite but i think we w would be very naive if we believed that like a boot camp a nine month uh nine month boot camp would give us everything we need for our entire career yeah. right yeah. like it helps us putting the our feet on the door but there's a bunch of stuff that we still have to learn so yeah trying to to fill that gap you know yeah. Before we jump to that transition, let me ask you, you had mentioned out of that room of, of hundreds of people, you and maybe four other guys spoke English. Was your English proficiency directly correlated to your gaming? Or uh, was there yeah. another reason <laughs> that you were so fluent? And I, I have some more context as to why I asked that. I have a lot of Swedish friends and their children are like expert English speakers at an extremely early age just because they are gaming so much. Well, I think it's a combination of gaming. Uh, I. I used to go to the cinema, to the movies, like two or three times a week. Okay. And I hated dubbed movies, so I was always, like, listening to it. And my parents, like, they forced me to go on an English course even when I didn't want to. So now, like, the reason why I'm sitting here today talking to you, having the job I have is because of it. So, nice. But when we were, like, 10, 11, you don't want to go to, 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 you know, course on a Saturday morning or whatever. Yeah. So, but yeah, I was prepared when, when the, the opportunity, um, appeared, you know? Yeah. Why don't you talk, talk a little bit about the uh, life on the, the oil rigs, because this, I, I mean, this hits near and dear to my heart because I, I think we had talked about where I worked on tugboats for several years yeah. before also doing the same <laughs> transition. And, you know, I, I listened to or watched a couple of your YouTube videos that I found about you. And I know you had mentioned, I think the schedule is maybe supposed to be either 20 on and 20 off or 28 on 28 yeah. off, even though it never ended up being that. I know for me, Geraldo, my first uh, hitch is what we called it. It was like 112 days because the way to work your way up in that field on the tugboat industry is just like time at sea. You had to put the time oh. in to work your way up. So what was it like? Did you enjoy it at all? Um. So if you are offshore, if you are in the rig, they there's like, at least in Brazil, they had a law. I think they tried to follow it here too, that you cannot stay more than 28 days mm -hmm. in the rig, but you can come back, stay a day home and go again. Oh. So they say like, you cannot stay more than 28 days, but you can just, you know, go in yeah. the helicopter, just stay 30 minutes and come back. So, and when you are on, on like, I don't know, Midland in Texas, you know, in the, not on, on the ocean, you can stay there for three months if you want to. And people, some people, they do that. But, um, you know, when I was 21, when I started like 2021, I loved it. Like who has a month off, you know, going back home and being able to travel and do whatever I wanted to do. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, but then with years coming and realizing that the more new, like the more, as I was promoted, um, I was getting less time home and more time working because mm -hmm. it's kind of like there's a lot of trainees and less supervisors, right? So, like, I remember times that I was, like, 25 days offshore. I would get home. Two days later, someone called me, and I would go back for another, like, three weeks and do that, like, three or four times in a row, yeah. you know? And it was, like, exhausting for me on uh, that time in Brazil. When I came back here, I had the, I was lucky enough to be put on an offshore rig. So I had this 28 days there. I knew that I, I would stay 28 days home. So for the most part, it was like that. But there were occasions where they were like, I need you in a rig in, I don't know, Alabama or whatever. And I had to like fly there, stay there for a while, knowing that I was going to have to go back to the rig after. So I was spending like two weeks off my time off in this rig because they needed me to fill. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty bad. I mean, like, I think for young people, like when you're just starting, it's fine if you if you see that as a mean, means to an end. But 
like you don't want to be away from home that much right. like the money can be good you know but um it, it it's not worth it you know yeah. i like when i growing up my uh, in living in friburg my my father he didn't have a job in the city i was living in so he would leave on monday and come back friday so i only had my father on weekends yeah you know it was like you know his sacrifice to give me a better you know um life when growing yeah. up and i feel like when i talked to my wife about having kids i was like i don't want to be away as my father was you know yeah. so that was like one of the things that made me want to change but i didn't care about that when i was 22 you know yeah no that makes um, sense and i i hear so much of my story in yours geraldo same thing my <laughs> dad was a tugboat captain as well before and growing up he would be away from home for upwards of like seven or eight months out of the year. So it wasn't even a weekend thing. And to mm -hmm. your point, I resisted that industry for so long just because I knew I didn't want to do that to a future family. But at some point during my own trajectory, I was like, you know what? I don't know what I want to do, but I'm tired of paying for education, not knowing what I want to do. So I'm going to go out there, get paid, push myself out of my comfort zone and learn something new. And it was fun for a while to your point, but uh, I, I just, the parallels are, are so, they, they resonate so much with me because this same calculus was going through my mind that it sounds like went through yours. So yeah. I'm, I'm curious in your journey, was it, you started to get frustrated? Is this the point? you just found yeah. springboard and you were like, Oh, I'm going to become a software engineer or how did that play out? <laughs> um, it's funny how, how things are. Um, so I was in this rig I, for some context, like everything that I did in the rig, like 20 days, I would have very hard work, like heavy lifting work for maybe a week. And the rest was working with computers, right? I would okay. control the systems taking like on computers every time that we need to do something i would go outside but heavy lifting was not like for the entirety of the of the, Got it. the my stay there um and I, i'm not a very mechanical person like i'm not the type of person that something's broken i try to fix i'm more like on computers i am but like i'm not i don't i don't fix my car i don't know much about cars and stuff i, I was never that kind of person and when you were on the rig you kind of like with people there they like that thing. So when you don't have stuff to like, I felt like I was not part of that group. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that from the beginning, I knew that I was kind of like, I'm, I was different, you know, like, uh, um, so there was a point when I remember like this clearly, it's, uh, I was so exhausted to have to do stuff that I did enjoy. I was so sad of being away from home that much. That one day, like on when you are on the rig, you work 13 hours a day, right? And mm -hmm. seven days a week. So you do like 91 hours a week when people are do 40 hours in the right. normal job, right? Yeah. So I was exhausted. So I, I like a, a line drilling, a uh, fluid line, ex like burst on me. So I had like hydraulic fluid all over me. I was, I, I had a shower and I called my wife and I started crying. Mm. Like, I can't do this anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't do this anymore. Um, and my wife was like, yeah, when you come back, we're going to talk about it and see like options, what we have, like, it's not worth for you to like be there and destroying you or like, uh, destroying you. And the next day I wake up, I go to this container that is where our office is that we shared with another uh, company. And there's this guy like doing a exercise a coding exercise and i'm like what is this and it's like oh this is a boot camp uh, i'm doing it because i don't want to be here anymore and i'm like <laughs> what give me what's the website right just talk to me just show me i never ever thought about like being a software engineer i had one experience with coding like a year before mm -hmm. because i was so mad that i was going offshore that much that i bought that book um uh, automating boring stuff or something like that mm -hmm. on, for Python. Automate boring stuff, yeah. Yeah. I had the same book. Be yeah, because I wanted to make like an Excel sheet that my boss could use to control people going offshore and staying home because th he had this whiteboard with our names and he would just like, who is first? James? Okay, J oh, James again. Geraldo again, you know? So I, I did that. He never used it. Hmm. Uh, and, and when I saw this guy doing the, the coding, I was like, I got to do it. And then I 
checked online to see like for how much money does people do like that because I have my bills and stuff. Can I transition to that? And I saw it was fine. I talked to my wife. I said, if I'm going to do that, we got to be okay with having a, uh, like a pay cut because I was a supervisor, right? Yeah. Almost, I had like nine years of experience, almost 10. Yeah. So, and she was like, I'm on your side, let's do this. And on Springboard, they have that prep course. There's a mm -hmm. one month for, so you can do the test. I did it in one week. Nice. I was so like, I got to do it. I got to do it. I did it in one week. I was approved and I started. Um, nice. And for next nine months i was like working 13 hour days taking a shower and studying for like two three hours in the rig yeah and then when i was home i was trying to do my best to do like five six hours and i think i spent more time doing it not because the the boot camp required me to do like i mean i was not spending all that time um I was not spending all the time like listening to the videos and doing the exercises, but like every single time that I learned something different, I was trying to apply on something. Yeah. Like I have 20 versions of my portfolio. I don't, <laughs> you know, like I did so many portfolios that, you, you know, and it was yeah. a, it was a fun experience, you know, that all the, from beginning to end. Yeah, no, it's amazing, man. And I just wanted to point out, you know, it sounds like you had a lot of support at home from your wife and that's amazing that, that, that definitely adds an additional dimension, I think, to the transformation and maybe not everybody has that, but I, I feel like having that support at home from the significant other is, it just makes any kind of transition so much easier. And I had similar support from my wife when I, I made the switch myself. And I wanted to ask you, I think you, you had mentioned when we chatted last week briefly where, you know, you had intermittent at best internet connection and you're going through this yeah. curriculum. So I think you had told me that you would like download the videos in advance and then just do the best you could while you're working. Is that right? Yeah. The internet there, it's not good. Um, normally you share like uh, one single connection with a lot of people. So it was like impossible to watch, like to, to, to buffer videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. I remember that I would like set up my computer, pre uh, press play, press pause, take a shower and come back nice. just to watch a video. And, uh, you know, to prevent that, I would just like, okay, I'm going to stay there three weeks. I want to do three modules and I would yep. just download the videos and do it. You know, I, and because of, like, because of being there, I was losing my weekly meetings with my mentors. So yep. everything I had was just like by email or talking to him and you know, he was pretty, uh, patient with me and, yeah. You know, he helped me so much. I even remember like <clears throat> coming with questions about stuff that was not even the curriculum and he would come back to me and show like, go to this repository, read this thing, you're going to learn it. And even like, why, why am I learning this if I can do that? And he yeah. was like, wait a second, next, next module, you're going to be doing that. Right. Because nice. like we did the same thing. Springboard has a funny thing about the curriculum that I think is very important. That is, I'm going to teach you the hard stuff yeah. and then I'm going to show you the easy stuff. And right. you're going to be like, so happy that someone spent time to change all those lines of code in just one thing. Yep. You know, I remember Redux and stuff the beginning, like before Redux and yeah. Um, yeah. That, when I think about it, it was kind of like crazy to be able to do everything and not stay like a year and a half doing it. Yeah. Did you, but do I the... was, no, go ahead. Sorry. Please. No, I was just going to say, but I was so excited to, with the idea of not having to wear coveralls again. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, I bet. Yeah. And that was helping motivate you throughout that. And, and I wanted to ask you, Geraldo, so zooming out a little bit, I know you had that prior exposure through that automating the boring stuff book that you did. Mm -hmm. But when you were quote unquote learning to code, and, and I'm asking because uh, I'm hoping that there's going to be at least one, if not more people out there listening that maybe they're in, they're on a tugboat or they're on an oil rig and they're like, man, maybe, maybe I can do it. Maybe I can't. When you were quote unquote learning how to code using springboard, did you struggle through that? How did that go? How did you keep yourself motivated and maybe push through any kind of barriers you had, especially given the fact to your point, you didn't have that weekly, at least synchronous correspondence with your mentor, which I know was yeah. invaluable in my own transition. 
Well, I had uh, a Skype group with a lot of other students that we would like help each other on like because sometimes sending an anime would take too long, so we had like a group of people to helping uh, to do the exercises and things like that. And mm -hmm. um, one thing that I uh, I still do today is that I I even talk to people when I uh, I'm interviewing people or. Uh, talking to you know the apprentices on, on, on my current job that I tell them like never be afraid of showing your weaknesses and doubts yes and um I was that I was always like I have this question I'm gonna ask I, I don't I, I don't care if I just asked something I'm gonna ask again so I would just bother everyone that I knew that was even on the same level than than I was or like mentors and you know on LinkedIn. I would tell like, hey, sh how do I do that? Or like, should I focus on this on that? So I never felt that I was like stuck or that I didn't have enough assistance. But I think that was because I was also like not expecting some help to to right. just fall from the sky, right? you know? Um, yeah, like... I think that with the thing of my me writing also the blogs and stuff about the experience of learning and things like that. Also, I had the opportunity of meet new people because of that. They would come to me and say, just read this. I'm on the same path. Hmm. Can we talk? And I would add them to the Skype group and things like that. Nice. So, yeah, I was I never felt stuck or or, you know, alone. Yeah. I felt tired. Yeah. But, uh, oh, I bet. <laughs> but not alone. Long hours. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So how did that play out? Did it? And so what I also wanted to ask you, did you do the, I guess it doesn't matter if you did the pay up front. I personally did like the pay by month just because I was able to dedicate like full time effort into that at the beginning, at least 60 hours a week. Did you just do the regular program, like the nine month projected schedule? Yeah, I did a nine month, but I did with that thing that you pay, you don't, you pay only if you get a job after six months. Right. Okay. Um. Yeah. Gotcha. Cause uh, I, Again, I didn't know anything about the the industry, yeah. you know. Um, I think that after ten years working one thing, I was just stuck in this bubble that was not seeing anything outside. Yeah. Even my LinkedIn, you know, was only for people on that, so I didn't know yeah. like how was the the job search, and so I was like, maybe yeah. that's the safest, the safe approach. Yeah. So how did that play out? How did the job search go <laughs> after you graduated from Springboard? Did they help you land the role? They didn't have to, like, because I got a job pretty fast, but, like, they did help, but not after my completion. So Springboard has this, had this partnership with some companies, and they would, like, participate on, uh, like, uh, people that were just graduating would participate on some interviews to, to get a job in one of those companies, right? So my c current company had this partnership with Springboard, they wanted um, people to be uh, apprentices, uh, and I was like ninety percent of the curriculum. Where when I received an email saying like, "Do you want to participate on this um, in, uh, apprenticeship program for this company? Um, do, are you, do you feel that you're prepared?" And I said, "Yes, I'm prepared. Uh, like, let's do it." Yeah. And it was funny because they gave me an exercise. They interviewed me. I passed. They gave me this exercise was a front end exercise um and i did it and when i did it i was sitting in a hotel room because i was going offshore and i was going to stay 28 days offshore and, and there was another uh, another uh, part of the interview and i sent a message to the to the recruiter and said hey i'll be away 28 days yeah can am I gonna have a, a shot on this? Like, right. are you guys gonna have positions open? And she said, "Yeah, of course we'll have. Don't worry about it." And I was like, "I'm gonna worry about it." Yeah. So, <laughs> so what I did was I was like, "I gotta do something to prove that I'm that I'm worthy," you mm -hmm. know. So I went to their website and I was like, "You know what? I can do this." So I cloned their entire front page. I did everything moving, like everything that you can think of. Oh, this moves, this increases, this reduces. I did everything. And I just sent to her. I said, please, I didn't say that, but I was like, please, I beg you, just hold a position for me. I can yeah. do this. 
Yeah. And it was worth it because when I came back, she said, sadly, uh, the front end position is is already like they picked up people, but we have this position that we I want you to to like uh to be the one. Are you okay with doing back end stuff? And I'm like, I was born to do back end stuff and <laughs> I just do it. Yeah, and I did the exercise and I passed and uh that's amazing. Yeah. And no. it was just like I graduated on Monday. I got the job on a Thursday. So that's amazing, man. Yeah. And so what was it like when, when you got that call or the email or whatever it was, and you were actually offered the job to become a software engineer? Ah, man. I, I, I to be honest, I don't remember what I did, but I'm pretty sure that I just sat down and cried for a second. Yeah. Because you know, one one of the things that I disliked the most about the oil field is that you don't receive much feedback, like even good or bad feedback. People don't talk to you about stuff that you can improve or they don't even say like, Hey, good work. And, you know, and shake up hands. Yeah. It's more of like you were in, you were part of a team, but you're kind of by yourself yeah. at the same time. And the fact that they kind of like waited for me and gave me this opportunity and gave me the thing, I was like, this is going to be a complete change in my life. I'm pretty sure it will. So mm -hmm. I was like, um, I I was speechless. I remember like I hugged my wife. I said, this is going to be something different. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just threw all my coveralls away. <laughs> everything that I didn't <laughs> have to go, like everything that I didn't have to give back. I was mm -hmm. like, I don't want to do this. Nice. Uh, I don't want to keep boots, this. Gone? Oh man, gone, gone. <laughs> You know, it's funny, like I joke around this, but I remember the, like some time ago I was organizing my my closet and mm -hmm. I found this old jeans that I would use just to go to the rig. Yep. And I threw it away because I was like, I don't want to have contact to to yeah. like this past life. Because again, like I was such I, I was in this bubble where I thought that that was everything that I could do with my life. Yeah. And when it burst. Even like if I know that the person I am today is because of that experience I had there, but it it, it also brings kind of like a, a trauma of me knowing that I spent that much time in something that I knew that wasn't for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's stuff that that's never fun in a moment. And again, Geraldo, I went through the, the same thing, you know, I, I quote unquote wasted, although I... I guess I'd, you call it rationalizing or whatever. You say it's not a complete waste because there are skills that translate. I know, I think you believe that as well based on some yeah. of the things I've seen you post on LinkedIn. But yeah, same thing. Six, seven years into an industry that has literally nothing to do with what I love doing now and what I do today. So it's not fun in the moment, but you, you definitely got through it. And I think it definitely helped fuel the, the transition that you made. And I have a feeling, even though we both, it sounds like we both love what we're doing today with uh, generative AI, chat GPT and whatnot, I think we're probably going to have to reinvent ourselves at least one more time oh, yeah. before it's all said and done. And I'm confident that we're going to be able to do that. So, but that's, that's the fun thing, right? Yes. Like that's the fun thing. Like who wants to do the same thing over and over again I agree. Uh, it, uh, for your entire life. Right. Yeah. I think that having this thing of like, oh yeah, I'm, I'll never be good enough and that's fine. It's better than just like, oh, yeah, I press this button once a day for the past 35 years or whatever, yeah. you know, yeah, that was, try. that's what makes life e uh, cool, you know? Yeah, no, I'm with you. And and I hope that other people that you worked with and, and people like that can see you and your story even before you come onto a podcast like this, but they can use you as an example of someone that made that transition. So they, they know it's possible. Yeah, and I try my best to tell people, even people that didn't do the transition, to understand how, um, uh, what's the word, like, how lucky we are to be working in an industry that gives us something, uh, like, so much, gives us so much, and um, if you don't have anything to compare to, you kind of think that it's, like, uh, it's because you, like, you deserve and that's yeah. it. Yeah, and so every time that I talk to to my coworkers, uh, uh, and I tell some stories about what I used to do and what I do today, um, they kind of like understand and, and realize like how they already won. I remember a, a 
one of the, the big directors of the com my company, he once he said, you guys understand you already won. Like you were mm. that young and doing something, you were working from home. Yep. You know, like you don't have to get dirty and stuff. You're yep. making good money. So I try, uh, there's even like one, I think I sent you the YouTube video that they did on the animation. Yep. They created this animation of me going from oil field to software engineering. And they said like, there's no stop, there's no explode button on my keyboard because <laughs> I said that to when I was doing the interview, like there's nothing that makes me worry too much on my current job or stress too much because I come, I, I, I came from an environment where if I did something wrong, I could die and it's yeah. not an exaggeration. So I said, there's no explode button on my keyboard. <laughs> And and I tell people that like don't don't stress out just we gotta we gotta figure yeah. it out like it's not worth it you know yeah and I can tell Geraldo I can tell you 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 ground your team and people you talk to I'm sure just because not everybody has the the background that you have or, or that we've kind of similarly shared so it it's good that you share those stories and I even catch myself having gone through a similar thing where I take things for granted like you I'm able to work from home. And sometimes you just got to zoom out and remember what we came from and just be so grateful and to try to practice that gratitude, which is something I'm trying to implement into a daily routine. It's not going well, but I acknowledge the, the benefits <laughs> of it and I'm trying to incorporate that. So I wanted to ask you, so are you fully remote? I'm fully remote. Yeah. Um, I'll have an offsite in a month, okay. but it's just because like I work with people from New York and other uh, right. states. So they try to do these meetings like at least twice a year or so, but I, I don't have to go to an, an office at all. I work uh, from okay. from home since the day one. And let me ask you, so onboarding as a remote employee, I know I've gone through not issues with that, but I acknowledge and I told my manager this when I opted to stay remote that it was more difficult than if I was in person. So I'm curious if you faced any struggles maybe relative to how it could have been if you were in person how did you work through that or maybe you just breeze through and uh it's been smooth sailing i think like since i was part of a class of apprentices it was easier because they prepared like a bunch of uh, meetings for us to ramp up and learn about the stuff we were going to do so that was easier than just me showing up there and you know right. um being alone and trying to learn yeah um but first day of work was the first day I ever opened a Mac on my life. I never had a Mac before. Didn't know how to do simple things like I don't copy and paste stuff. I was like, where, where is the control button? Where, <laughs> like, uh, you know, like I was yeah. like, I'm gonna lose this job in three days. They are gonna ask me to copy something, and I'm not gonna be able to. And they're like, oh man, <laughs> this guy's gone. And and. So that thing was complicated. I never used PyCharm. I use PyCharm. I work with Python 99% of my time. So I never used PyCharm. I was used to VS Code. So I was like, here's another thing that's gonna uh, it's gonna take some time to get used to. Yeah. So ramping up was kind of like um, it was not hard, but it was complicated because they expect you to learn a lot of stuff in a very short amount of time. And since I came on from with this job with a bootcamp experience, they had some expectations that I I was not able to 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 um, uh, what's the word to like to get to it uh, because I didn't have a Mac, right? So like small mm -hmm. stuff, I had to like oh my god, I gotta improve this. So the first couple couple months, I was like working late hours just because I wanted to learn stuff that people already knew before, like yeah. before I started. But after that was pretty chill. Um, I worked as I'm a backend engineer. Um, I was able to. They gave me this project. They gave a project to all uh, apprentices, and they said, "We want to give you something that is worth your time. I'm not gonna give you something that we're gonna throw away after the fin the completion of your apprenticeship. And by doing that, we are also giving you responsibility. Right? You have like timelines and and expected dates to deliver stuff and i i was able to deliver my project uh I, actually all the apprentices were able to deliver their projects um but i i was i i think i was the only apprentice that before the end of the apprenticeship i applied 
for the on-call stuff that mm. you said in the beginning. Um, since like our company run pipelines every every day, even on weekday, uh, weekends, so we have this rotation where we try to have someone on call. And I was like, I'm ready. I don't have to wait until the apprenticeship to end to be able to do that. Our team at that point had broken into two small teams. So the rotation was even more like, like you didn't have a lot of time between on call shifts. So I was like, I can do this. And uh, I think that helped me to like, again, ramp up faster and um, yeah. take, take some, some t- take some weight from my coworkers shoulders and, after that, I got the full time offer. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. And let me so just for more context for the listeners, my understanding of on call, at least in regards to LinkedIn, and I believe it's probably the same for you. But I'm, I'm curious of your perspective is if you are on call for your team, basically, you are the person that is the uh, I kind of think of them as a liaison for any other teams or any downstream consumers that might have issues trying to reach your service and that's 24 mm-hmm. 7 even if it's 2 or 3 a.m i know we have automated systems where i haven't been on call yet but you will get a text message and if you don't answer mm-hmm. that you'll get a call or something like that and if you don't and answer that you don't get... your manager will get a call and then that's not going to be fun the, the next <laughs> day so is is your experience the same is 24 that's... 7 on when you're on yeah that's exactly it uh-huh. uh I'm lucky enough to work on a team that most of the stuff we do is on working hours, okay. but we had times where it was in the, like 2 a.m. whatever, and I had to to um, to wake up and and do yeah. it. But it's and part of the it's part of the job, right? It's, yeah. it's again now we have a better rotation. I don't yeah. I get shifts once a month and a half or so, yeah. and it's never like you were by yourself, right? Like. Right. You are the one that receives the message, yep. but most of the time, some people will show up to to assist you with. Yeah, but was that the same? Fun. Tell tell me like that two a.m. when you got woken up and had to do something. That's where because I haven't been on call yet, Geraldo. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm nervous or worried that it's going to be something way beyond me that I'm going to have no idea how to do. I'm not going to be able to reach anybody. How was that for you? Was it was it something you kind of knew how to do anyway? How did you handle that? So it. It it's never the case where you cannot reach anyone because the same okay. way we're paid, you can page someone. Okay. Okay. Uh, make sure to be very friendly with that person. Gotcha. Yep. <laughs> but you but you can you can do it. So it's never like you're alone, right? Okay. Um and for the most part, the times that I had to work uh like two AM whatever to fix an issue was not very complicated. Okay. And when it is, you have to like reach out to management and say like yeah, this is going on. How you want to escalate that? Uh, depending on your level um, as a software engineer, right? If you're a senior or a staff, whatever, you can make decisions on your own. But yeah. like currently, um, what is called L5, I'm below senior, but I'm not a junior anymore. Um, I still have to like, I can give you all the context, but the final decision is still not up to me. Sure. So on cases like that i had to to reach out to some people but it was it was funny because the first week of on call i probably had some i was so afraid of losing a page that i set up my slack channel to notify me for every time someone would send a message on this room and it was just screaming like every five minutes because people were talking in the channel right. but i was like i can't miss a, a message right. And then I was like, I don't need this. I only need the, the alerting. <laughs> and the next time I went to sleep and my wife was like, what's going on? It's so quiet. And I was like, oh my God, is my phone on mute? But it was not. It was just because nothing was going on. But, and then after that, I, I was just like, it's fine. Like, yeah. I know what's going on. And if I don't, I know that I'll have to support, you know. I've heard you learn a ton from on call and a lot of the things you learn, you probably can't learn unless you're thrown to the fire, so to speak. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I am looking forward to that as much as anyone can look forward to an on call <laughs> rotation. So, so man, you went from being an apprentice and then it sounds like you got promoted to the next level. What was that like? Did that solidify it even more and maybe prove it more to yourself that, that you belong or did you always kind of, were you kind of comfortable growing into the role? Well, when I got the the uh, the, the full time offer was the moment I knew that I didn't have to I, I was not I, I didn't have to go back to to nice. to the oil field you know it was just a confirmation of six months of me trying to prove my to myself and to them 
that I was able to learn, you know, if I could just like make a comparison between like my first job in the oil field and this job is that normally what they want in for uh, in an employee uh, is that they are open to learning new things, you know, right. like I did a mechanical technician course and I was working with geology. I was working with pressure and stuff that I never learned on my on the course I did. But when I did the interview, they knew that I was capable of learning. Yeah. That's why they sent me to I, I mentioned to you before I, I worked in in Russia, in the Emirates, I worked everywhere. Because they knew that I was capable of learning whatever they needed me to to do. And I think it's the same thing here. During the six months that I was an apprentice, I not only learned everything that goes from like writing a line of code to like deploying stuff, I was able to be on call. I was able to share my everything that I was learning with, you know, other apprentices. I was able to uh, ask the right questions, right, like, document uh, like documents and specs and stuff and i was uh, when i got the, the offer i was like yes i can do this yeah. uh and uh they know that i can do this which is awesome you know yeah, yeah. no it's amazing man you've got a you've got yeah. an awesome transition story i know i'm not the the first person to tell you that and i won't be the last <laughs> i have I, I wish i could show you one thing that i do but uh, on the back of my computer here on the on the wall Every time that I receive like a good feedback, I print it and I frame it. So oh, I have, God. I have stuff on my wall just to, like if I'm feeling down, I just read something, you know. Like if I'm feeling that I, oh my God, I won't, I not learned this at all. Like I'm yeah. lost or whatever. I try to remember the times that I thought the same thing and I was able to, to, you know, just destroy that wall and keep yeah. going. That helps me. I'm going to yeah. steal that and I will attribute it to you <laughs> just in case my wife or anyone else asked that. That's a great idea because to your point, you know, there's going to be ebbs and flows, ups and downs. It's life is like that as will programming and any other job that you're in. And I think it's so critical to, to try to work through the lows, obviously, just so you can get back up. And that's a great technique just to, to remember <laughs> and to kind of dwell on. The, the past praise that you've had. So I'm going to borrow that. Uh, I'm glad, <laughs> man, I, I always learn something yeah. from talking to, to smart people like yourself, Geraldo. Sh share your wall later on, on LinkedIn. I will. And I'm <laughs> I'll gonna, share I'm mine. Gonna, I'll tag you in that for sure. You're, you're, you're <laughs> going to have more compliments than me, but I'll just copy and paste like the same one over and over again. All right. Well, before we wrap, <laughs> yeah, before we wrap, I've got a few hot seat questions. If you're up for them, so we can better understand the psychology of the man himself. You up for that? Okay. Yeah, of course. All right. First question. What does your typical morning routine look like? Um, so I, I try, I'm trying to follow, like, I don't know if you ever saw the Huberman lab on yes. YouTube. I try to follow like some stuff that he does. I try to wake up. So I, I started, I start working at nine, but I wake okay. up at six. I am trying to sit down inside for like 10 minutes or so, just because there's a study that says if you take some sun in the morning, it helps you even with sleeping at night. Yeah. So I try to do that. And then I go to the gym. I work out for like an hour, an hour and a half. Nice. And then I come back home. Uh, I try to do some study on the college that I'm, um, classes that I'm taking. And if not, I have a treadmill on my garage that I try to run a little bit. I try to do the, the, uh, the cardio here. And then, it's almost nine when I finish all of this. I try to read something to like, I didn't go to the psychology area of stuff, but I do read a lot about psychology and, you know, social sciences and stuff. Nice. Um, so I try to read a little bit more and then I start working. I like it. If money didn't exist, what do you think you would do every day? If what didn't exist? Money. Money? I would be, there is this, there is this place in Brazil called uh, Sana. It's just like kind of a hippie community in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. I I used to go there when I was a kid because my uncle is uh, the hippiest hippie that you can think of. <laughs> and he has a ranch there. Uh, I think that I, if I didn't need money, like money didn't exist and I could just leave, I would just stay there because we have like this, he has this ranch. My mother has a small ranch there too. Okay. Middle of the mountains, 
like uh River in the back, I would just like, I don't know, have a video game there just because <laughs> and just stay there, you know, Okay. with Enjoy my family, it. I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. If you could send a single message to your former self to help you through this transition into tech, what do you think that message would be? Do it earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, like, I, I think I wouldn't say that because I travel everywhere. Uh, with, like every all experience I have, all experiences I I created, you know, was because of that job. Yeah. But I think I would say like you were more than that, you know. Don't think that you're stuck on it just because you never did anything else in your life. Yeah, you know. Yeah, no, I think that's that's good advice. And it, it's funny how in my own journey I I made all kinds of excuses as to why I couldn't do it yet. And just like you. Once I quote unquote made it, and even before, I was like, "Why didn't you do this earlier?" So I think that's great. Yeah. Anyone out there listening you know, that's on the fence, it doesn't mean you have to quit your job, but take a step in the direction just to to validate that interest. When I decided to come to the states, I sat down with my parents and I said, "I'm gonna go." Uh, I was 28 when I came, so I said, "I'm gonna go." Uh, if everything goes bad, I can always come back here. I have a career here, like in Brazil. And my parents said yes. And then my father came to me and said, my entire life I worked on something I didn't like. So I'm on your side, like do this. I'll mm -hmm. be here if it, everything goes bad. Wow. And when I did an interview about this transition for Springboard, um, they asked me a question like, if you could say something to people, what would you say? And I said, don't be a what if person. Don't grow up to be a what if person. Don't get old to be a what if person. You know, try to do stuff. And if it fails, it fails. It's fine. Yeah. Do it in a safe way. You know, like don't quit your job just yeah. to, you yeah. know, but do it in a safe way because I would hate myself to be an old guy like thinking, yeah. what if, what if, what if, just because, just like sadly, like my father, after like years of years doing some stuff that he didn't like, yeah. you know, so. Yep. I That's was a good. I was interested thing. to that. Jeff Bezos has a, uh, I think it's the regret minimization framework where he projects out being 80 or I think now because he's getting older, he makes himself 90 on his rocking chair looking <laughs> back at his life. And he basically wants to make choices throughout his life such that he has the least amount of regrets. And yeah, I think it's very similar to what you just said. And I think that's such a powerful framework. Yeah. Through which he's, he can he stole life. it for me. Yeah, I believe that. I guess you are. You're a smart guy. <laughs> All right, Geraldo, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about today or anything else that someone trying to transition into tech needs to hear? Uh, just do it. <laughs> As I said, don't be a what if person. I think it's worth it. Um, and you never know how much you can you can do and learn with your life if you don't you, if you don't have the doors open for opportunity. So just go ahead and do it. And um uh, yeah, you. Uh, if anyone want to talk, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm glad yeah, to help. I was going to ask uh, you: Is that the best place for people to go and find you and to? to yeah, reach out? I, 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 I think so. Like, don't be sad if I take a little bit too long to to answer, is because I was so addicted to LinkedIn that I try myself, try my best to not have it open all the time. But I'm always glad to help. I'm always willing to help. And uh, yeah, it was pretty cool talking to you, James. Um, I appreciate yeah. you inviting me. Yeah. No, man, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. I learned so much from you, as I generally do, and I, I'm blessed to to know more about you. And I know there are people out there listening that are going to take away all kinds of wisdom from the, the dimes that you drop. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you got value from today's show, please consider leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Spotify. It's a free way you can support the show and help other people just like you find the story and others like it. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to follow the show on whatever podcast application you use. And most importantly, if you know someone that might be interested in breaking into tech, tell them about the show.